Are you thinking of moving to Phoenix, Arizona in 2022 or 2023? In this episode of Living in Luxury with Marsha Kennedy, I'm going to talk about everything you need to know about relocating to the Valley of the Sun, including the real estate market, the lifestyle, the housing, the weather, and of course, my pros and cons of living in Arizona. Basically, everything about working, living, loving, eating, and playing in Phoenix, Paradise Valley, and Scottsdale, Arizona. This video is broken down into four parts. Part one is an overview of Arizona, just to give you a 30,000 foot level view. But in general, people are drawn to the Phoenix metro area because of its strong economy, relatively low cost of living, high quality of life, economic opportunity, and the weather. With over 300 days of sunshine, which I would argue would be 360 days of sunshine because even if it's rainy, the sun always comes out. Part two is my pros and cons of living in Arizona. Part three is the state of the real estate market in general and in Arizona because after the crazy we've had for the last two years, everyone needs a break. I'll discuss if the market will crash or if it's just a correction. Part four, there's five areas that I think are the best places to live in Arizona, and more specifically in the Phoenix metro area. I concentrate in the high desirability areas, also known as the luxury areas of Phoenix, including the Central Corridor, the Biltmore Corridor, and Arcadia. And then I add in Paradise Valley and South Scottsdale because they're so close. As you can see from Central Avenue in the Central Corridor, driving east on Glendale Avenue, which turns into Lincoln Drive, it's only three miles. You drive one more mile and you hit Paradise Valley, which is only four miles by four miles, and you hit South Scottsdale. I cover these areas because this is where I live, and these are the areas I specialize in. I focus on the luxury market because it's more fun. My name is Marcia Kennedy. I'm an Arizona native and have been a real estate broker for 12 years. I've helped hundreds of buyers relocate to Arizona, which I love because I get to meet the best people. I have such a great group of friends because I become friends with all my buyers. So if you're thinking of moving to the Phoenix metro area, keep watching or just give me a call, send me a text or send me an email and I'm happy to answer all your questions. Also, I've included a link in the description where you can download a buyer relocation guide. That should be really helpful to you for your move to the Valley of the Sun. Let's move into part one, an overview of Arizona. Arizona became the 48th state on February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1912 which makes it only 110 years old. From 1945 on, cold weather retirees began to flock to our mild and pleasant winters. When air conditioning was introduced by a local company, Gettle, this is still around today, it made the summers acceptable. Land was annexed, master plan communities were built, and new industries were welcomed. Phoenix had grown from 100,000 people to 3 million in just 50 years. That's half the population of the entire state of Arizona. As part of the four corner states, Arizona is the largest landlocked U.S. state by population, which leads us to the population of Arizona now. It is 7.3 million. That's about one third the size of California, which has a population of 21 million. Just to give you some perspective, Arizona is the 14th most populated state in the U.S. We have 15 counties. Maricopa County is the largest with a population of 4.5 million. Phoenix, of course, is the capital and largest city with a population of 1.7 million, which makes it the fifth largest city in the U.S. When you hear or read about Phoenix, they're usually talking about the Phoenix metropolitan area, also known as Greater Phoenix, Phoenix Metro, Valley of the Sun, the Salt River Valley, or known to locals as just the Valley. It's also called the Phoenix Mesa Chandler, Arizona Metropolitan Statistical Area, which includes both Maricopa and Pinal County. And it's made up of 24 cities and towns, including Phoenix, Paradise Valley, Scottsdale, Tempe, Mesa, Glendale, Chandler, etc., with a population of 4.7 million. Arizona is a great place to retire. Approximately 21% of our population is age 60 or older. Okay, now that we have a little history, I'm going to give you a lightning round of fun and interesting facts. Number one, Arizona is known for the five C's, copper, cattle, cotton, citrus, and climate, because these were the considered the building blocks of Arizona's early economy and are all featured on our official state seal. Did you know that more copper is mined in Arizona than any other states combined? And the Marenzi mine is the largest copper producer in all of North America. Also, Arizona grows enough cotton each year to make more than one pair of jeans for every person in the United States. That's over 330 million pairs of jeans. Crazy, right? Number two, some might say that Arizonans dance to their own drummer, but we really march to our own time clock. Arizonans don't spring forward or fall back. 
and time is the same no matter what season you're in. Number three, Arizona has had the highest and lowest temperature in the same day. Our climate of geography is so diverse. We have mountains and we have desert. In August 2002 in Safford, Arizona, which is about three hours southeast of Phoenix, the temperature was 52 degrees in the morning and 105 in the afternoon. No one else can say that. Number four, the official state flower is the saguaro cactus blossom. It blooms in May and June in the middle of the night and closes the next day. It's only available 18 hours for pollination from animals like bats and moss during the night. The saguaro cactus can grow as high as a five-story building and can store up to nine tons of water. If a saguaro begins to grow arms, it's at least 70 years old. If a saguaro has one fully grown arm, it's at least 100 years old. If there are several arms and flowers, it's probably over 200 years old. Now, this is very important. If you cut down a protective species of cactus in Arizona, like the saguaro cactus, you could spend more than a year in prison. So don't be cutting down our cactuses. Number five, Arizona has the greatest percentage of its acreage designated as Indian tribal land in the United States. Number six, Arizona has almost 4,000 mountain peaks and summits, more mountains than any other mountain state, more than Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. We have Humphreys Peak, Mount Baldy, Chiricahua Peak, and the Kaibab Plateau, which is at the Grand Canyon. Number seven, the city of Phoenix was named for the mythical Egyptian phoenix bird, which burst into flames and was reborn from its ashes because Phoenix sprouted from the ruins of the former civilization. You will see the phoenix bird at the Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. Number eight, we have more canal miles than Venice and Amsterdam combined. Hundreds of years ago, the Hohokam built the canals to transport water. After they vanished, the European settlers arrived and started digging canals and found these ancient waterways. Today, the Phoenix metro area has more than 180 miles of canals, as compared to Venice, which only has 26 miles, and Amsterdam, which only has 60 miles. Number nine, we have Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. She grew up on a large family ranch near Duncan, Arizona, and most recently lived in Colonia Miramonte, next to the famous Camelback Inn in Paradise Valley. I've sold many homes in Colonia Miramonte, and one day I was just outside of the guard gate and stopped in my car. Sandra Day O'Connor was behind me, and she went around in a huff and said to the guard, what does this girl think? This is a parking lot. She might as well park right on Lincoln Drive. Yep, I made a good impression with a Supreme Court justice. All right, number 10 and most important. Arizona has an amazing reptile diversity, which includes six turtle species, 49 lizard species, and 52 species of snakes. Among the snakes, there are 13 species of rattlesnakes, which is just over one third of the world's rattlesnakes, and more than can be found in any other U.S. state. But don't worry, they mostly live in the desert. What are the pros and the cons of living in Arizona? I'm a native Phoenician, which means I was born in Phoenix, which is really rare. Most people that live here were not born here. Which brings me to my first pro and con about living in the Phoenix metro area. People move here from all over. Why? Because of the over 300 days of sunshine. Plus, it's stunning and despite inflation and the crazy real estate market, the cost of living and property taxes are still lower than many other states. A few facts. From 2016 to 2020, over 64,000 Californians moved to Arizona and over 17,000 moved from Washington State, plus over 15,000 from Texas. As you can see, people are coming from all over, but these states have the highest in-migration to Arizona. And these are the top 10 metros moving to Arizona from June to August 2022. We always have a lot of people moving here, but during the pandemic, we had over 200 people a day moving to Arizona. Pro is the diversity of people who live here, which I love. That's why the Chicago Cubs spring training sells out and why we have a lot of pizza places. What's not to love about that? When you're driving around, especially from September to May when the snowbirds come, you can see license plates from all over. I was just in LA and almost every license plate was from California. Here you see license plates from California, Washington, New York, New Jersey, Wisconsin, almost every state. I love it. But there's a few cons with that. Con number one is that everyone brings their own special driving pattern. I've been to defensive driving school a few times and they always tell us that there's more accidents in the Phoenix metro area than any other city because of these special driving patterns. Con number two, 
because of the increased traffic and because of the terrible heat during the summer, our roads wear down and need repair. So registering your car in Arizona is expensive as you can see here. But if you live here less than seven months of the year, you do not have to register your car. Another con on our roads wearing down is that there's lots of rocks that hit your windshield and break the windshield. So you have to make sure your insurance, which most insurance companies do, covers the windshield in Arizona. There's a group in Arizona that's experimenting with a light colored paint that's applied over the dark road to reduce heat. Hopefully we can get to a situation where our city is not becoming hotter and hotter and hotter because of the roads. A special note, we have a lot of traffic cameras that will catch you for speeding or running a red light, which I hope you don't do. Tickets are expensive. Generally, if you go nine or 10 miles over the speed limit, you'll be fine. But if you go one more mile over, at 11 miles over the speed limit, the camera will flash and you cannot fight that ticket. I set my cruise control for nine miles over the speed limit and that usually keeps me safe. Okay, number two, the weather. Of course, it's a pro and con. Everyone talks about the weather. The pro, eight months of the year, it is amazing. Right now, it's the end of October and it's just stunning. I haven't had to use my air conditioning for a couple weeks now and have had the windows completely open all day and all night. I go for a walk every morning and it's a bit chilly. Then the day is warm and then it's chilly at night. It's my favorite time of year. October and November are spectacular. They are so gorgeous. The days are in the 80s and the nights are in the low 60s and high 50s. It gets a little cold in December and when I say cold, I mean in the high 60s, low 70s during the day and high 50s at night. On Christmas, it seems I'm always wearing shorts and a light sweater. I only own a jacket, gloves and boots for skiing. I went to Jackson Hole on New Year's Eve a few years ago and it was 20 below. I've never been so cold in my life. So the weather here is great in December. January can be the same, but sometimes we get a couple really cold days where it rains and even snows, but the snow usually melts right away. We did have snow that stayed on the ground for about three hours in January, 2021. Everyone freaked out. I went into a meeting and came out with my car covered with snow. It was so beautiful. The air was really crisp and clean and the mountains were really dark. It reminded me of Colorado. February and March get into the 70s and then April and May into the 90s. In my book, anything under 100 degrees is fine. So that's my pro about the weather. The con, from mid-June to about the end of September, it is unbearable. You go from your air-conditioned house to your air-conditioned car to the air-conditioned office or an air-conditioned restaurant or shopping center. You can really feel how people get crabby by July 4th. I usually go to San Diego over the July 4th weekend. This year, I stayed here and spent the entire day in the pool with friends. It was great and so much fun, but I was so sunburned. I also think we have that seasonal affective disorder during the summer months because I'm so crabby, I don't have any energy, I can't sleep, it's terrible. I can't tell you how much better I sleep and feel eight months of the year. Most people try to leave during the summer. I stayed the summer and left about three times for a week each time. I went to Sholo, I went to California, I went to Cape Cod, but I'm planning on leaving all next summer. It's so weird that I used to run around barefoot when I was little. The heat didn't bother me at all, but now it really bothers me. In 1990, I worked outside during the summer. I was part of a zeroscaping project for the city of Phoenix. Zeroscaping is when you, your landscaping requires very little water. Anyway, it was so hot on June 26th specifically that you could fry an egg on the sidewalk. We of course tried it and it worked. I think it got up to 120 degrees that summer. It was so hot, the planes couldn't land at Sky Harbor Airport because their tires would explode. So plan on going somewhere else during the summer. Prescott's an hour and a half north and about half an hour farther is Flagstaff. Sholo's lovely, it's, it's about three, three and a half hours northeast. And there's always San Diego, which is only a six hour drive or a one hour flight. Most of the year, the heat is a dry heat. I'm sure you've heard that. But our monsoon season begins in June and continues through September, which means we have higher humidity, which leads to thunderstorms, which are great, heavy rain, lightning, hail, high winds, flash flooding, dust storms, and really extreme heat. August is the worst. When you walk outside, it feels like you are walking into a hot, wet sauna. You can't even catch your breath. 
and the pool's like bath water and you can't take a cold shower. During that time, we have some wicked rain, thunder, and lightning storms and we also have habuds. The term habud is from the Arabic language and means blown. A strong Arizona habud can last for a few hours and travel over 100 miles. They are giant walls of dust created from high winds rushing out of the collapsing thunderstorm. The cold air in front of the storm rushes down at an incredible rate, picking up massive amounts of dust and sand and blowing them in the air. They're really cool, but if you're outside or driving, they're dangerous. And boy, do they spread the dust. Speaking of dust, we got dust. I mean, we live in a desert, right? So I don't have carpet but I still vacuum every day. It amazes me how much dust gets into the house. The number three pro is the beauty of Arizona. This is a huge pro. Growing up here, I never really appreciated the beauty of Arizona. I went to University of San Diego, and then I lived and worked in Europe, South America, and Asia. I've been to so many gorgeous places, but I always come back to Phoenix. I like Arizona as a base, and now I really appreciate how stunning it is. Everyone thinks it's all desert, but there are desert plants and cacti that have gorgeous blossoms. And there's areas of Arizona that are so green and plush, like the Central Corridor, the Biltmore Corridor, Arcadia, and South Scottsdale. Most of Paradise Valley is more deserty, if that's a word, but there are areas that are very plush. The thing I like most is that no matter which direction you drive, you see mountains. Camelback Mountain, of course, is my favorite. It's like our beach. If you buy a home that has a view of Camelback, you are in heaven. When you play golf at the Biltmore, you tee off with views of Camelback, Piestor Peak, and South Mountain. All right, the next thing I love are the cacti and wildflowers. There's 83 types of cacti that grow wild in Arizona, and during the spring, cactus flowers make the desert so colorful. There are many types of cactus flowers with each having its own unique color and shape. Although spring is when the flowers are crazy beautiful, we see color all year long. Okay, palm trees. I love palm trees. They're everywhere, and it feels like you're in Beverly Hills. Plus, at Christmas, we have palm trees wrapped in light. Speaking of palm trees, let's talk date palms. Most people don't expect to find a date ranch in the middle of Phoenix, but in the Mont Grove neighborhood near 44th Street and Camelback, you'll find nearly 300 date palms. It's where the black Sphinx date grows at exclusively. The history of the Sphinx date goes back to the 1920s when it was originally discovered. The person who found it said it was a new kind of date and wanted to grow more. So a grove was planted in Arcadia. It was a farming neighborhood that became residential in the 1960s, and those same trees are still producing these dates in the yards of this Arcadia neighborhood today. Residents harvest the dates every mid-September and sell them to places like the Sphinx Date Company in the heart of Old Town Scottsdale. If you wanna have a really good date shake, go to the Sphinx Date Company. I've left the information in the description below. They also have local honey, salsa, nuts, wine, and beer. And yes, Arizona has local wine and beer. The next pro is citrus. Citrus is one of the five seas of Arizona. In some parts of Phoenix, like Arcadia, it feels like living in some kind of a garden of Eden with the abundance of lemons, grapefruit, oranges, pomegranates, and limes. In fact, Arcadia used to be orange groves. There's so much citrus, people will leave fruit at the driveway for anyone to take. I love to have a fresh grapefruit in the morning and make some great cocktails with citrus. And the orange blossom smell is delicious. It's such a yummy feeling to smell the orange blossoms in the spring. One of my favorite things about Arizona. When I was little, we had two dachshunds, Daisy and Holly. They would walk around the yard with their noses in the air, sniffing the orange blossom. It was so cute. All right, birds. No matter what time of day, those birds are singing. Because the weather has turned cooler now, I open up all the windows and just listen to the birds all day long. In my old neighborhood in Arcadia, my neighbor told me that someone brought two lovebirds to the neighborhood a long time ago, and now we have tons. They chatter and sing all day long. My favorite bird is the hummingbird. Many people put out bird feeders with the sweet red water that attracts hummingbirds. We were up in Shola and watched a very territorial male hummingbird sit in a tree and watch to see if another hummingbird came to the feeder, and then he would swoop down and rush them off. Okay, next sunsets. Arizona is known for its sunset. From late June through early August th during our monsoon season, clouds build up during the day, sometimes bringing the most powerful storms in the late afternoon that finish by sunset. So you can catch sunsets with enormous cotton candy clouds that glow gold around the edges during the summer. All right, lakes. There are many lakes right in the middle of the desert. Lake Pleasant, Roosevelt, Canyon Lake, 
and a beach, which is Lake Cavasu. It's one of the best places for hitting the beach and having a good time. Dotted along 400 miles of shoreline are stretches of soft sand, ideal for setting up lawn chairs under a sunshade. Lake Havasu is about three and a half hours from Phoenix. People will rent houseboats or bring their houseboat and have week-long parties there. So fun. If you just want a day trip, Lake Pleasant is only 45 minutes from downtown Phoenix. It's a 10,000 acre lake that shimmers in the desert sun like a massive oasis. It's set up for hundreds of visitors with easy access and a full range of services including marinas and campgrounds. It's a busy spot with power boats and jet skis racing all over in all different directions. Farther out from the shoreline, the lake's quieter and it's out there that you'll find sailboats gliding along powered by warm summer wind. Canyon Lake is my favorite because it is so clear. The water's like glass. Water skiing is great there. And it's only 45 minutes from Phoenix also. There's so many lakes, Bartlett, Lake Powell, Roosevelt, Saguaro. I'll put a link down in the description so you can find your perfect lake. Okay, my number four pro is property taxes. In the Phoenix metro area, our property taxes sit at a low 0.62% compared to the national average of 1.07%. And to compare, California's property taxes are 0.76%, Florida 0.89%, New York 1.73%, Connecticut 2.14%, and New Jersey 2.49%. Okay, my fifth pro of relocating to Arizona is the lifestyle. With so many days of sunshine, you can get outside and do so much. The valley has some of the most amazing hiking trails and golf courses. You don't have to travel far to enjoy some time in nature. I put links in the description to everything I'm going to talk about now. Golf. We have over 300 golf courses in Arizona with over 200 in Greater Phoenix. My favorite is the Arizona Biltmore Golf Club. There are two courses, the Lynx and the Adobe, and it's so plush and green and surrounded by the views of Piestua Peak to the north, Camelback Mountain to the east, and South Mountain to the south. It's stunning. The 19th hole, the Adobe restaurant, is great, and you can bring your dog. Phoenix is said to have the best urban hiking in the nation. For the most part, Phoenix is a very flat city with no rolling hills, but it's completely surrounded by mountains. Camelback and Piestua Peak, formerly Squat Peak, are right at your doorstep in central Phoenix. Camelback has two trails. The Echo Canyon Trail on the north side is very hard. It's like rock climbing. I don't like that trail. The Choya Trail that you enter on the east side of the mountain is hard, but lovely. The trail's been closed due to construction and trailhead realignment. The new trailhead will now have drinking fountains, restrooms, and bike racks. If you want to go farther out, there's Pinnacle Peak, Tom Thumb up in Cave Creek, Lost Dog Wash, and North Scottsdale in the McDowell Mountains. So much hiking, so much fun. Eight months of the year, hike. If you're craving a season, it's just a short drive to see the leaves turning in the fall. Again, you can drive north to Prescott or Flagstaff an hour and a half to two hour drive or go in the winter when there's a huge snow dumps. If you want to keep going, you can drive a couple more hours to the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument, which has some of the most unusual geological formations in the country, including the wave. Then there's Sedona, with the famous Red Rock Buttes about two hours away. You can see a meteor crater near Holbrook about three hours away and drive another hour to see the painted desert in the northern section of the petrified forest in the Navajo Nation. If you want to go to the beach, Rocky Point is only four hours and of course San Diego is six hours or five hours if you drive with me. Disneyland is six hours, Grand Canyon is four and a half hours, Las Vegas is less than five hours. By the way, we went to Las Vegas in November once to play unlimited golf. Yes, unlimited golf with three days of 36 holes a day at Lake Las Vegas. It was so cold, it was practically snowing. I thought the weather was exactly like Phoenix, but it's not, it's colder. So make sure you check the weather before going to Vegas. But if you want cold, go there in November. The beauty of Arizona, I have to say, is absolutely gorgeous. For walking, running, and biking, the Arizona Canal is great. I walk on it almost every night, just before sunset. It's such a magical time of day. The mountains have a pink color to them that's stunning. You can start on Central Avenue on the Murphy Bridle Path, walking north to Orchid Lane, which is just north of Northern Avenue, and take the Arizona Canal through the Biltmore, through Phoenix Paradise Valley area, through Arcadia, and into Scottsdale. The Arizona Falls is a 20-foot drop along the Arizona Canal between 56 and 58th Street on Indian School Road at Herberger Park in, in Arcadia. It's kind of cool, and you can stop and play a game of pickleball if you want. 
Shopping. Many visitors come to Phoenix and Scottsdale to shop. We have the Billmore Fashion Park that includes Saks Fifth Avenue, Ralph Lauren, Pottery Barn, and Lululemon. Plus some of my favorite restaurants, True Fruit Kitchen, Pizza Pomodoro, and Blanco Tacos and Tequila. Scottsdale Fashion Square is in the heart of South Scottsdale at Scottsdale Road and Camelback. It's in the top 30 of the largest malls in the US and it's very successful. There's more than 240 specialty stores and restaurants including Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom, Dillard's, Macy's, and you can eat at Nobu, Ocean 44, Francine, Toca Madero, and Zinc. Restaurants. We have so many amazing restaurants in Phoenix and Scottsdale. And what I love the most, many of them have outdoor dining and you can bring your dog. Obviously I love dogs. If we meet in person, I'll give you a list of my favorites. I took my Northern California buyers to Blanco Tacos and Tequila at the Biltmore Fashion Square and introduced them to the Cheese Chris. It's now their absolute favorite restaurant. The Cheese Chris is an open-faced flour tortilla covered in shredded cheese, and then it's put on a metal pizza pan that has been brushed with butter and put under a broiler until it gets crisp. We grew up on it. I think it was created in Arizona, but if you ever want to try one, let me know. They're so good, and I will take you and have one with you. Next is Desert Botanical Gardens. When I have friends visit, I always take them to the Desert Botanical Gardens. They recently had the Chihuly in the desert as seen here. It was great because it's lovely to walk around, have dinner, learn about the unique, beautiful plants that thrive in some of the hottest and driest parts of the world, including cactus, agave, succulents, trees, and shrubs. During the spring and fall, when the weather's cool, they let you bring your dog on Sunday mornings and they have many special events throughout the year like Dia de Muertos, which is now, music in the garden during the fall, chilies and chocolate in November, and Las Noches de la Luminarias. International flights. I like that Phoenix Sky Harbor is an international airport. I've flown direct to London on British Airways many times. It's about a two hour flight to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico, which is lovely. Flying to the East Coast is a bit hard, but it's doable. All right, museums. We have so many museums. Downtown Phoenix has the Heard Museum, Phoenix Art Museum, Arizona Science Center, the Children's Museum of Phoenix, and Scottsdale has the Musical Instrument Museum, which is very cool. It also has the Scottsdale Museum of Art and Western Spirit. We also have Taliesin West, which was Frank Lloyd Wright's winter home. It was established in 1937 and is known to be as Desert Laboratory in Arizona. There's so many events and festivals all year long, with fewer in the summer. We have First Friday Art Walks in downtown Phoenix, which is a really thriving art scene. From small stages and galleries to boutiques and murals, there's no shortage of creative expression. Thursday Scottsdale Art Walks start at the waterfront that spread into the art galleries in Old Town Scottsdale. They have events all the time. In January, we have the Fiesta Bowl, Rock and Roll Marathon, Barrett Jackson Car Auction, and the Waste Management Phoenix Open, which is a wild party. We have Cactus League Spring Training from February to March. The San Francisco Giants play at the Old Town Scottsdale Stadium, and the Colorado Rockies and Arizona Diamondbacks are at the Salt River Fields at Talking Stick in Scottsdale. And then, within a 30 minute drive of Scottsdale, 12 other teams, including the Chicago Cubs, the San Diego Padres, and the Texas Rangers, they slug it out at stadiums across the valley. We have NASCAR in March and November. Chandler has an ostrich festival in March. There's a Country Thunder Music Festival in April. In the summer, Desert Botanical Gardens has flashlight tours at night because it's so hot during the day. The Arizona Diamondbacks and the Phoenix Rising Football Club have games and matches from April to October. Fondly known as the X Factor, fans of the three-time WNBA champions, the Phoenix Mercury, offer non-stop action on the home court all summer long. We have spring and fall restaurant week. During the 10 days, you can take advantage of a three course meal or prefix meals for $33 to $45 per person. In the fall, of course, from September to February, we get to watch our beloved Arizona Cardinals. And there's so many great uh, tailgaters. From October to April, the Phoenix Suns and the Arizona Coyotes, which used to be the Phoenix Coyotes, play. In October, we have the Arizona Taco Festival, the Phoenix Pride Festival, the Greek Festival, and Schnepp Farms has a pumpkin and chili party. We have the spooktacular Hot Air Balloon Festival, Dia de los Muertos Festival. We have lots of Halloween events. In November, there's the Bentley Scottsdale Polo Championships at Talking Stick Resort and Casino. Yes, we have casinos. We have 25 casinos and they're all operative as Native American gaming facilities. In November, we have the Charles Schwab Cup, which is the last stop at Championship PGA Champions Tour. This is the senior tour. I worked for IMG in Hong Kong and I ran professional sporting events like golf. 
Tom Watson was in the Hong Kong Open. He asked me to take him out on the town after the tournament. We were out all night. In fact, he almost missed his plane flight the next morning and I would have been in so much trouble, I would have been fired. He's really fun and it was a great night. In December, there's the Tempe Festival of Art and don't forget, the true cowboy experience. You can take boot, scoot, and dance classes in front of a live band at the Handlebar J Saloon in Scottsdale. Or drive about 30 minutes north to Cave Creek and ride the mechanical bull or dance all night at the Buffalo Chip Saloon, where you can also go to church the next day. <laughs> there are plenty of horseback riding companies and we even have a cowboy college. The next thing I love about our lifestyle here is staycations. My favorite hotel is the Royal Palms Resort and Spa. It's right in Arcadia at the base of Camelback Mountain on Camelback Road. It was a 1920s winter home and original Spanish colonial revival villa. The pool's really fun. The Hermosa Inn was a private turn of the century escape for the painter Lon McGargy, who was known as the Dean of Cowboy Artists. It's located in Paradise Valley and has been turned into an intimate and luxurious inn. Lon's restaurant serves very interesting food. I think I once had snake, or maybe it was ostrich. You sit outside under the mesquite trees and there's lots of roasting, smoking, and wood grilled food and great wine. Sanctuary, you can eat at Elements or sit at the Jade Bar. The view of the praying monk on Camelback Mountain is delicious and the drinks are pretty good too. Camelback Inn is an old time favorite. You can go to Rita's Cantina and Bar and sit outside. They always have someone playing the guitar. It's really nice. And then the Biltmore, it's been completely remodeled and has a great pool and this huge slide. I had some buyers come in and they stayed there and their kids went on the slide all day long. It was really cute. Okay, here's a big con. Snakes, scorpions, and jumping cactus, oh my. Like I said, Arizona has 52 species of snakes and 13 species of rattlesnakes, but mostly in the desert. So watch out when you're hiking. In all my years of living here, I've seen one snake in the desert. There are about three dozen scorpion species in the state of Arizona. All of the species can sting and they cause some immediate pain with little or no local swelling or redness. Only one type of scorpion, however, can deliver a life-threatening sting, the bark scorpion. Scorpions live on a diet of insects and they eat crickets. Crickets like citrus. So that's why there's so many crickets and scorpions in Arcadia. We flipped a house in Arcadia and I was the real estate broker and designer working with a builder. He didn't bring in a pest control company early enough, so we had an infestation of crickets. They just kept multiplying and they were really loud. The house was stunning, but when I had a showing, I would have to clap my hands really loud to make them stop. We finally called in the pest control who had to apply treatment three times. After each treatment, I had to get to the house two hours ahead to clean up hundreds of dead crickets and two or three huge scorpions. It was so gross, it was vile. I'm not a fan of scorpions or crickets. So word to the wise, get a good pest control company no matter what, wherever you live in Arizona. Also, apparently putting lavender in your shoes will keep scorpions away. I've never had a problem, but my, my buyers who live here usually do that. The Choya cactus is also called a jumping cactus because of the way these sharp spines seem to jump out and attach to your skin. And so you have to be careful. Don't even get close to them. Here's another pro. We have great universities and higher education. We have ASU and Tempe, and over the past 20 years, ASU has grown from a general desert university to a world-renowned public research institution and has been designated as the most innovative university ahead of MIT and Stanford for the last seven years. I went to the Thunderbird School of Global Management, the number one international graduate school in the world. It used to be a small, almost grade school-like looking school in Glendale. We were pretty much in the middle of nowhere, but the students and the professors came from all over the world, so it was truly international. And now I have friends everywhere I go. It's really fun. ASU took over Thunderbird in 2014 and sold the campus and then built a state-of-the-art campus in downtown Phoenix. Second undergrad is University of Arizona Tucson and there's NAU in Flagstaff. Okay, the biggest con is water. In fact, it's one of the hottest topics around. Since 1994, 28 years, we have been in a drought. So where does the water come from? The majority of our state's water supply comes from the three major sources, the Colorado River, groundwater, and in-state rivers. With the explosive growth in Arizona, 
we have water issues. In fact, as of today, Lake Mead is so low that they found four bodies. More than 90% of our water supply is surface water that originates as snow in the mountains north and east of Phoenix. As the snow melts, it flows into the reservoir on the Colorado Salt and Verde Rivers, where it's stored for future release to our water treatment plants. These extensive reservoir systems allow for the capture of water during the wet periods used during the dry period. Fortunately, Phoenix holds high priority rights to the use of these surface water supplies, so they're extremely reliable. In addition, over the past century, Phoenix has taken proactive measures to secure additional surface water rights which further enhances our water supply position. The Central Arizona Project, or CAP, conveys water about 190 miles from the Colorado River at Lake Havasu on the Arizona-California border through a system of canals to Phoenix, Tucson, and beyond. The CAP system includes a series of pumps and integral storage reservoirs at Lake Pleasant on the Alba Fria River. The system is capable of carrying up to 1.8 million acres of feet each year. The Salt River Project, SRP, then conveys surface water from the Verde River and Salt River watersheds that lie to the north and east of Phoenix. The SRP system is composed of seven dams and lakes, of which Roosevelt Lake is the largest. SRP delivers water throughout the valley using a system of the canals and 255 high capacity wells. These canals stretch over 131 miles and use gravity to move water. Phoenix water plants receive about 20% of the water delivered each year by SRP to the metropolitan areas. My really good friends run a groundwater science company. They told me that Phoenix Metro is going to be fine. It's some of the small towns that have not planned for a water shortage that are not going to work. Will the housing market crash in 2023? Okay, crash is a big word, especially when you're talking about real estate. But looking at current economic conditions and recent financial uncertainty, plus rising mortgage interest rates, it's easy to wonder whether the housing market, after years of a red hot market, will crash in 2023. I'm going to discuss the housing market as a whole and then speak specifically about the Phoenix metro area with respect to inflation, interest rates, supply and demand, and of course, prices. Full disclosure, I can't look into a crystal ball and predict the future. And I'm just a real estate broker that wants to give you the most informed information about the Arizona real estate market because everybody asks me. As with most things, there's more at play than just the current conditions. In order to understand the range of predictions for a possible crash in the near future, which are plenty, it's important to look back at the past couple of years, particularly in relation to the pandemic. For the pandemic, the housing market was on fire. It was humming along just fine. People were buying and things were pretty much moving quickly. When the pandemic and the associated lockdowns hit, people felt cooped up and realized they wanted more space. With remote work, people's homes became much more important and they wanted bigger spaces. That's why so many people moved from California to Arizona. They could work from anywhere. They could sell their home quickly for a higher price and get a larger home at a lower price. Even though prices are higher than normal in Arizona, home prices are still much lower than California. In much of 2020 and 2021, demand for homes was high and supply was low and interest rates were the, at historic lows. Put together, these factors created a hyper competitive seller's market with buyers swarming to new listings, making cash offers and hurrying to outbid each other. The result in Arizona where inventory was low and demand was so high led to higher home prices. If we look way back to 2008, the crash was concentrated in a few states, California, Arizona, Florida, Nevada. Home price growth was over 20%, but in Arizona, it was 30%. And the national home price growth was only 11%. Now the national home price growth is 14% with the price appreciation distributed over 38 states, not just a few states. This split between in-demand areas where prices are still high like Arizona and areas where prices are already falling further implies that a broad crash likely won't happen. It will be more of a correction instead of a crash. We hope. Let's talk about inflation. Some economists attribute the U.S. inflation surge to product shortages resulting from the global supply chain problem largely caused by the pandemic. Another cause is strong demand driven by historically robust job and wage growth. The cooling housing market is an intended result of the interest rate hikes the Federal Reserve began back in March. Higher interest rates puts downward pressure on the value of assets, which is supposed to discourage 
spending and thereby reducing inflation. So let's talk about those interest rates. Interest rates have fallen to historic lows since the height of the 1980s when they were at 15.8%, which translated into mortgage rates of around 18.5%. Can you imagine? To combat inflation, the Fed has increased interest rates quickly to 3.8% and mortgage rates have increased to 7.1% the highest we've seen in 20 years. So what are the pros and cons of increased interest rates in our current market conditions? The pros, we have a strong labor market with a low 3.5% employment rate and interest rates are still historically low. So companies with purchase power can borrow money. The cons, we have had two consecutive quarters, Q1 and Q2, with negative gross domestic product growth which means that we are in a recession. But then the economy grew barely in Q3. So now what? Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said on October 28th, we're at a full employment economy. It's very natural that growth would slow. And it has over the first three quarters of the year, but it continues to be okay. We have a very strong labor market. I don't see signs of a recession in this economy at this point. But we also have an inverted yield curve on the bond market, which means investors are now demanding more money to lend to the government over shorter periods of time. That's an indication that investors expect economic growth to decline soon, perhaps within a year, and that the Federal Reserve will need to cut interest rates below where they are now to help an ailing economy. So again, now what? <laughs> Most economists are predicting that rates will level off and may decline slowly next year. In fact, the Mortgage Bankers Association is expecting a recession to hit in 2023 and expects rates to fall to 5.4% by the end of 2023. That said, this year has taught us that the accuracy of any prediction on rates is only good until the next inflation report. The Fed's been raising interest rates in the expectation that those increases would curb inflation. And while it has had a moderating influence to date, it remains to be seen whether the inflation is fully controlled. If you want to balance the additional long-term cost of higher mortgage rates, there's ways to offset it. You can make a larger down payment by bringing more cash to the table, or you can get an adjustable rate mortgage and refinance later, or you can pay cash. I was on a call today and a mortgage banker said that they have a new program that allows buyers to pay the current interest rate. And then when the interest rate falls, they can refinance without any fees. So if today's rate is around 7.1%, but it's predicted to be 5.4% next year, and you found your perfect home, you could pay the 7.1% for one year. Experts believe rising interest rates will slow and prevent a market crash by keeping demand among current homeowners low. With rising interest rates, current homeowners who may want more space aren't keen to sell just because they're enjoying a low interest rate. And even if they sell high, where do they move at a lower price? Whatever you do, don't panic. Lower demand, longer days on market, and a higher interest rate isn't the worst case scenario for buyers. If homes are sitting on the market for longer periods these days, that's not necessarily a sign of a crash. It could simply be a matter of pricing. Homes are only sitting on the market because sellers are not willing to negotiate. Anytime a seller and broker price a home realistically, it sells, even with higher interest rates. There's still cash buyers and international buyers who are willing to pay top dollar and who don't have to worry about the changes in the rates. If you look at statistics over the last 50 years, according to Freddie Mac, the average interest rate was 7% and the market in the late 80s was 18%. So although it's sticker shock from the last few years, experts don't think it's going to deter the market too badly. There's definitely going to be a correction. Fingers crossed we don't have a crash. Let's talk about inventory, also known as supply. A healthy housing market averages around 2 million to 2.5 million active listings nationwide. As of the end of October 2022, the United States currently has roughly 1.28 million homes for sale. It's expected the housing inventory levels in 2023 will rise, but it'll take time because there's such a housing shortage across the United States. How quickly we'll see the housing shortage gap close will depend on how many homeowners decide that it's a suitable time for them to sell. Inventory will probably remain limited because baby boomers are probably going to stay in their homes while millennials might look to enter the housing market. That's all according to experts who believe that while the market 
won't crash. It will definitely experience a correction in 2023. I know everyone wants to time the real estate market, but the reality for most of us is that the reason we buy or sell a home has more to do with lifestyle decisions. Do you need to move for a job? Do you need to be near family? Do you want to retire? Do you need a second home in Arizona? So what's next? Regardless of whether the market crashes, there's definitely changes coming in the new year. Lenders need to lend. They're already offering lower adjustable rate mortgages in the range of 3.75 to 5% to bring buyers back to the market. And as I mentioned, they're getting creative with allowing buyers to refinance in a relatively short time after buying. So what are we seeing now on the ground level in the Phoenix Metro housing market? We're enjoying a more balanced and healthy market. Nobody thought that they, we were going to be able to continue to sustain that level of price increases. We had off the chart buyer demand with very little inventory. So as that pace slowed down over the last few months, sellers started feeling a complete panic because of the slower market. Buyers are now able to negotiate again. However, well-prepared homes and well-priced homes are still selling fast. And how's that a bad thing? Yes, for sellers, you can't just throw up your unprepared house and expect to get 20 offers over the weekend. But for buyers, it means that when you look for homes, you have more options to look at and you aren't competing with five other offers. Buyers are able to have a reasonable inspection period now. Before you buyers get too drunk with power, please remember that we still have low inventory on the market. Properties in the luxury market are still selling quickly in comparison to a few years ago. It depends on the neighborhood and the price range, which I'll go over when I discuss each of the five areas that I think are the best places to live. Seasonally, our market picks back up in January and it's pretty competitive until May or June. So the best time for a buyer to purchase is now until the end of the year. Usually the end of the year is the best time. Let's talk about demand now. Do people still want to move to Arizona? The answer will always be a resounding yes. From 2019 to the beginning of 2022, Arizona had the highest influx of high net worth households. That means that people were moving to Arizona at a higher rate than most other states. And we all know why people are moving here. The weather, the relatively low cost of living, the large lots, low property taxes, and home prices. Although higher than normal, they're still good. So what's not to love? I think that we were undervalued in Arizona for what this area offers. And I do still really believe that it's a good time to buy for people coming from more expensive areas like California, New York, Chicago, etc. Our desirability here in Phoenix, Paradise Valley, and Scottsdale is expanding. The largest number of people moving to Arizona after the 38,000 people who came from the Los Angeles area are 10,500 Asian buyers with cash. For people who have lived here for a long time, the increase of cost of living is a bit shocking, not only due to in-migration, but the current state of the economy. But again, where can local homeowners go that isn't more expensive than Phoenix and isn't as great as Phoenix? To support this higher cost of living, the Phoenix area needs to continue to grow and attract businesses with high income employees. So while we're on the subject, what about growth? Is it still happening here? Absolutely. We have so many companies moving here. So far in the fiscal year 2023, the Greater Phoenix Economic Council said it was working with about 61 international businesses to find a site in the valley an 85% increase from a decade ago. Amazon is providing over a thousand jobs. Honeywell is hiring over 600 people and a huge Taiwan semiconductor plant is being built in North Phoenix. They plan to hire over 2000 employees. So Taylor Morrison is building 1200 new homes. Honor Health is expanding by building a North Phoenix campus and a New York developer starting construction on a massive industrial park. This area is about 20 minutes north from central Phoenix, but it brings activity and revenue to the state of Arizona, which is a good thing. The Cromford Index was created by a mathematician named Michael Orr. He uses information from the Arizona MLS and creates great analytical data so that we can get a feel for what's happening in the market. The Cromford Index shows the relationship between supply and demand because supply and demand determine price, right? As you can see here, in mid-February mid and late March, interest rates increased, which increased monthly payments so it pushed many buyers out of, out of the market and demand plummeted. At the same time, this is when sellers thought, oh my God, I better put my house on the market now to get the price that my neighbor got a few months ago. Now they're in the despair area of the market cycle because their homes are staying on the market a little longer. 
and their prices were too high. And so they have to lower their price or offer seller concessions because they're not getting the price their neighbor got in January. It's supply and demand. When supply equals demand, we're in a nice balanced market. The number of sellers almost equals the number of buyers. Let's see how price has responded to supply and demand. As you can see in this graph, we were in a normal market where supply equaled demand between 2001 and 2003. This is when lenders started to offer subprime mortgages and everybody got qualified. Lenders were giving out two and three mortgages that they didn't qualify for. Demand went up, supply went down drastically, and prices skyrocketed. But people started defaulting on those loans which caused supply to skyrocket, which led to the 2007-2008 market crash. And we became a huge buyer's market. So as investors bought up all the properties, prices started to go up again, and they've consistently risen since 2012 with the frenzy from 2020 to 2021. And here we are. We're definitely in a balanced market, but supply is still low with all the people moving here. So you still need a fierce negotiator on your side to get what you want. The Arizona housing market has experienced two consecutive years of record breaking price rise. Home prices could continue to rise as a result of lack of available properties. Over the last two years, home values have risen by 54%. And over the past five years, 93%. That's crazy. So if the market price drops 20%, 30%, 40%, or even 50%, anyone who bought two years ago or more will be fine. So let's talk about price. In the Phoenix Metro market, yes, prices have fallen about 8% from June to September, but they increased $100,000 from January 2021 to January 2022. This doesn't constitute a crash. Again, it's a correction. What about appreciation? You know what we're seeing? a decelerization of appreciation. Again, not a complete free fall crash in prices. Homes are staying on the market longer and there are more homes to choose from, which again is a good thing if you're relocating to the Valley. This is all general information about the Phoenix Metro area. My advice would be to become very knowledgeable about the micro market where you want to live and look at the facts about what you are buying. Let's look at the five markets that I specialize in. We're gonna talk about the central corridor right now. Annual median sales price actually went up from the beginning of the summer until late October. Now, this number is interesting because it only includes a small volume of homes. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. But the point is, the media will tell you prices are crashing. They're just not. They're staying about the same. But this is a good time for buyers to negotiate because the lowest time in our market is from September to December. So although the annual median sales price has gone up in the Central Corridor, sellers are panicking a little bit because their homes are staying on the market longer. So it's still a good time to buy because you can negotiate. Now, appreciation has gone from a crazy amount from the middle of summer at 31.3% down to oh, almost 24%. How terrible is that? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy to think that we're thinking that our market is crashing when we're at a 24% appreciation rate. The appreciation is just decelerating. Again, back in 2014, when we were in a balanced market like we are now, where the number of sellers equal the buyers, appreciation, the lowest appreciation was 9.1%. And as you can see, always at the end of the year, it's, it's lower because it's our slower time. Okay, let's now look at the Biltmore Corridor. Again, the annual median sales price has gone up. The appreciation, yes, it's dropped from 25.4% down to 20.5%. And again, look at this. In 2014, when we were in a balanced market, the appreciation rate was 15%. The Biltmore homes hold their value. All right, now we're in Paradise Valley. The annual median sales price, Again, it's gone up, not a lot, but it's gone up. And again, we were at 35, 36% appreciation rate, we're down to 32%. And in 2014, the lowest was 7.2%. Now we're gonna go to Arcadia. Annual medium sales price, 1.270. It's about, it's staying about the same. Appreciation, 33% down to 29%. In 2014, it was 7.8% when we were, the last time we were in a balanced market. Now we're gonna talk about South Scottsdale. There's two zip codes that I'm gonna go over here. In 85251, as you can see, the annual medium sales price has gone up. We were at 32.3% annual appreciation. We're down to 29.8. Last time we were in a balanced market in 2014, we had 5.1% appreciation. 
Okay, A5258, this is more McCormick Ranch area. Again, annual median sales price increasing to 1.1 million. Annual appreciation rate in March, 30.5%. Now it's down to 22%. Again, 2014 in a balanced market, 5.5%. But after all this analysis, really what it comes down to is what you are looking for in your Pacific area where you want to live. It's not about trying to time the market. It's about your lifestyle and about knowing the value to you. In fact, the best time to buy or sell a home is when the time is right for you, for the reasons that are important to you in your life. The one thing that none of us can ever get back is time. So stay true to yourself and don't lose yourself in the chaos of this crazy real estate market. It really is about what you personally can buy with your lifestyle that's sustainable for five to 10 years. Home prices will eventually come down, but our real estate market's cyclical and another price increase is bound to happen. Nobody ever became poor owning real estate. You keep it and hold it as long as you can and you try to acquire as much of it as possible because everything always goes up over time. You can't say the same thing about other investments. If you want to move to the Phoenix metro area, give me a call. I have your back. I'll negotiate the best deal for you. I'm a fierce negotiator. I'm like a mama bear protecting her cubs. Okay, area number one is the Central Phoenix Corridor, concentrating on the zip codes 85012 and 85013. The Central Corridor is bound by Northern Avenue to the north, Camelback Road to the south, the 7th Avenue to the west, and 7th Street to the right, which are known as the 7s. It's a few miles from downtown Phoenix, 15 minutes from Sky Harbor International Airport, and so easy to get on the 51 and the I-17 freeways running north-south, and the I-10 freeway that runs east-west, west to California. The North Central development of Central Avenue area began in 1895 when William J. Murphy platted the Orangewood subdivision. His concept was to create a suburb of Phoenix that established rural homes at an easy distance from the city. He believed that the large lot size would attract upper income residents of Phoenix, wealthy outside investors and immigrants who would utilize the lots to build large estate homes surrounded by citrus groves. It really is the original place to live as it's gorgeous, convenient, and includes some of the Phoenix most historic homes and luxury estates. Surrounded by stunning mature shade trees, manicured lawns, large open yet private lots, the central corridor has its own mix of architecture. Cape Cod, French Provincial, Ranch, and now more modern homes are being built. If I was to generalize the central corridor, I would say it's suburban but close to downtown Phoenix. Mostly upper income, lots of families, large lots, and tons of gorgeous trees. The historic Murphy Bridal Path runs along both sides of Central Avenue where you will see walkers, runners, bicyclists, families, parents with strollers, and dogs. Lots of dogs. Enjoying the posh trees and the serene views. You can go north on the, on the Bridal Path and hit the Arizona Canal that will take you all the way to Scottsdale. The Uptown Farmer's Market is held on Saturday and Wednesday mornings where you can have a great cup of coffee, eat breakfast, buy local produce, food, and handcrafted goods. And you can bring your dog. It's pretty fun. There's tons of restaurants that you can walk or bike to that are locally owned, including Postino, Windsor, Federal Pizza, and Joyride, along with the best ice cream called Churn. It's so good. Uptown Plaza includes AJ's, an upscale grocery store, and Chula Seafood, which has my favorite seafood. There are over 50 public, private, and, and charter schools that families can choose from, and multiple churches and synagogues with multiple denominations. Home prices range from 700,000 to up to a couple million. The medium annual home price is $975,000. Most homes do not have a homeowners association, which is great. If you wanna dive deeper into the Central Corridor, including the homes currently on the market, click on All About the Central Phoenix Corridor. The second area I love, because this is where I live, is the Biltmore Corridor with the zip code 85016. The Biltmore is bound by Lincoln Drive to the north and then one and a half miles south to Camelback Road with 24th Street on the west side and one mile, you just drive one mile to 32nd Street on the east. 
It's one and a half square miles of our 900 acres of plush green grass and mature shade trees with more than 17 communities and includes the famous Arizona Biltmore Hotel, the Arizona Biltmore Golf Club, and the Biltmore Fashion Park with high-end shopping and restaurants. Though the lush Biltmore neighborhoods feel secluded and tucked away because most of them are gated, it's close to pretty much everything because it's located right in the middle of Phoenix. The area allows for quick access to downtown and is only 10 to 15 minutes from the Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. There are about 1,600 homeowners that include single-family homes, patio homes, townhomes, and condos in a variety of styles, including historic homes, mid-century modern, multi-million dollar luxury estates, and even new construction. Many of the homes are along the Adobe and Lynx golf course, and some of them are nestled behind stately fences, which further creates a sense of privacy, safety, and exclusivity. The Arizona Canal Trail, that is a haven for walkers, joggers, cyclists, etc., cuts through the area while stunning Camelback Mountain views can be seen from both golf courses the hotel, the shopping center, and many of the homes. Some of my favorite restaurants are here. Hillstone, which has the most delicious grilled artichoke, Mwah! and the restaurants at the Biltmore Fashion Square, True Food, Blanco, and Pomodoro Pizza. Of course, golf at the Arizona Biltmore Golf Club is fantastic, and hiking is so convenient with Piestua Peak and Camelback Mountain in your backyard. This area doesn't have a lot of families like Central Corridor and Arcadia and Paradise Valley. It's mostly retirees or second homeowners. But since we have open enrollment, kids can go to any school in the Central Corridor, Arcadia, and Paradise Valley. So home prices range from $460,000 for a small condo to $8.9 million on the exclusive estate circle. The medium annual price is $684,500, which is much cheaper than Central Corridor because there's more townhomes and patio homes and condos, but most homes have an HOA and it's a big fee in the Biltmore. I go into more detail about 10 of the 17 communities of the Biltmore Corridor here. Third best area to live, hands down, is Paradise Valley with the zip code 85253. Surrounded by the iconic Camelback Mountain to the south, Phoenix Mountain Preserve to the west, and McDowell Mountains to the east, the town of Paradise Valley is a quiet desert oasis that lies between Phoenix and Scottsdale. The town was incorporated in 1961 and it's only four miles by four miles to equal 16 square miles with a population of almost 14,000 and approximately 5,700 households. Thanks to low density zoning restrictions, which stipulates that each property has to be a minimum of one acre, homes are nicely spaced apart, maintaining privacy, plus there aren't any street lights. So Paradise Valley is often considered a quiet and more private alternative to Scottsdale. The exception to the minimum one acre rule is gated communities like Colonial Miramonte, Mountain Shadows, Mona Lucia, and the new Ritz-Carlton residences that offer access to resort amenities such as golfing privileges, concierge services, and award-winning restaurants. Affluence is nothing new to the town of Paradise Valley. For decades, it's been the most expensive zip code in Arizona, 85253, with famous people like the Kellogg family, Alicia Keys, Michael Phelps, Muhammad Ali, Emma Stone, former U.S. Vice President Dan Quayle, and Charles Barkley. Paradise Valley is home to some of the world's best resorts and golf courses. The Camelback Golf Club, Mountain Shadows, which is an executive course, the Phoenician, and the private Paradise Valley Country Club. Hiking up Camelback Mountain is amazing. There's great resorts and restaurants at those resorts. Camelback Inn has Rita's, there's Hearth 61 at Mountain Shadows, the Prado at the Mona Lucia is fantastic, and elements in the Jade Bar at the Sanctuary are divine. I've stayed or had dinner or had a massage at each of these resorts for staycations or girls weekends. The schools in Paradise Valley are good. The main area that everyone wants to live are the three C's because they're rated A+. There's Cherokee Elementary, Cochise Middle School, and Chaparral High School. There's also Kiva Elementary, Mojave Middle School, and Saguaro High School, which are also very highly rated. There are many private and charter schools also, including the A-rated Montessori Academy and Phoenix Country Day. There are churches galore along Lincoln Drive, Palo Christi Presbyterian Church, Paradise Valley United Methodist Church, Valley View Bible Church, and the Franciscan Renewal Center, Casa de Pazibien. It's just called the Casa, which is guided by Franciscan friars and works cooperatively with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Phoenix. Home prices range from 1.1 million, you won't find a single family home under a million dollars in Paradise Valley, to a $30 million spec home that has not been built yet but it'll be amazing. The median annual price equals $3.2 million. Paradise value is exquisite. I go into more detail in this video if you wanna know more about the real estate, prices of homes on the market, etc. 
fourth area I love and have lived in is Arcadia and Arcadia Light with the zip code 85018 and a little bit since Scottsdale at 85251. There's not many HOA fees here, which people really like. So there's three parts of Arcadia. There's Arcadia Property, Arcadia Light, and then Lower Arcadia. We are going to talk about Arcadia Proper and Arcadia Light today. Arcadia is located between 44th Street and Scottsdale Road and Camelback Road and Indian School Road. Although most of Arcadia is in Phoenix, the area east of 64th Street is in Scottsdale. Arcadia is renowned for its expansive grassy lots, citrus trees, contemporary ranch homes, excellent schools, and some of the valley's greatest restaurants. Buyers who want a tight-knit neighborhood keep picking Arcadia. Many of the older homes have either been remodeled or completely rebuilt into very large estates, but the family atmosphere remains. The SUSD school district is the finest around and offers many options, plus charter schools and private schools. The Henry is my favorite restaurant, but I also love the restaurants mentioned near the Biltmore and Paradise Valley because it's all so close. The median annual price is $1.7 million. Arcadia Light is really in the Camelback cor Corridor to the east of Arcadia proper and to the west of the Biltmore Corridor. Technically from 32nd Street to 44th Street, Camelback to Indian School. It's known for its eclectic crowd where you'll find fun places to meet friends and hang out like La Grande Orange, The Vig, Postinos, and Ingo's all at 40th Street and Campbell. Arcadia Light is a friendly, safe neighborhood with lots of people walking their dogs, riding their bikes along the canal, having coffee or a glass of wine at night. You can really hang here. I'll give more details in this video about Arcadia and Arcadia Light. Check it out. Scottsdale is a curious city. On one hand, its Old Town District conjures up the Wild West vibes. On the other hand, its downtown shopping area is modern and upscale with golf courses galore and the highest concentration of AAA Four Diamond Hotels in the nation, it's one of the best places to live in Arizona. It's perfect for families or retirees for second homes. The crime rate is low, education is top notch, and it has some of the best shopping in the Phoenix area. Plus, Cactus League Spring Training Games, the Waste Management Golf Open, and the Barrett Jackson Auction have long been draws for spring visitors, ensuring a steady flow of winter and spring people here. Scottsdale has grown to a 2020 census count of 269,000, which if you're from California, it's about one-fifth the size of San Diego and the same size as Irvine. If you're from Illinois, Scottsdale is one-tenth the size of Chicago. It's now the state's seventh largest city. Scottsdale is annually rated among the nation's most desirable community to live in, visit, and do business. Old Town Scottsdale has more than 90 restaurants 320 retail shops, and more than 80 art galleries. New condominiums are going up throughout this area, which is drawing more empty nesters and millennials. And McCormick Ranch is my favorite, is one of Scottsdale's first big developments. The Arizona Canal has been redeveloped into a popular spot for living and playing. You can see the waterfront here. Scottsdale's known for its nightlife. Whether you're looking for a trendy club or a sports bar, you'll always find something to enjoy in Scottsdale. Scottsdale Fashion Square Mall, a luxury shopping center, boasts more than 1.9 million square feet and over 200 brands. Old Town also has many boutique shops, whether you're looking for jewelry, unique fashion items, or artwork. The Scottsdale Art Walk takes place every Thursday evening, where all the galleries open their doors for you to stroll through and see various artwork. The Scottsdale Art Walk is a 30-year tradition. There are so many options for biking, running, hiking, playing sports, or nice walks with your dogs. Chaparral Park has baseball and soccer fields and a fantastic dog park. Scottsdale Unified District includes Pima Traditional Elementary, Mojave Middle School, and Saguaro High School, known for not only the STEM and advanced placement programs, but for sports. Plus there are basis, public charter schools, and many private schools. There's such a mix of people in Scottsdale, lots of families, but a lot of retirees and snowbirds. There's also a lot of young professionals. I'm going to concentrate mostly on McCormick Ranch, which has a green belt that runs through it where you can walk, run, ride, and walk the dogs. There's amazing golf courses, and there's McCormick Stillman Railroad Park where there's free concerts in the spring at night before the summer months hit. But I wanna mention the waterfront residence at Scottsdale Road and Camelback Road, right across from Scottsdale Fashion Square, which is truly the most refined, most luxurious, and most accessible condominium project in downtown Scottsdale. For almost 3,000 square feet, a four bedroom, three and a half bath, it's $2.8 million. This place has 270 degrees of views, including mountain views, city light views, canal and garden views, and two balconies. 
The Scottsdale Waterfront residents offer 24-7 front desk, valet parking, full-time concierge, gorgeous club room, a fitness center. The rooftop has a zero-edge pool that features stunning views in every direction. It has a spa, a gas barbecue grill, and outdoor kitchen. You pay $1,400 a month for the HOA fees, but you get luxury living. Let's talk about McCormick Ranch. McCormick Ranch is, is approximately seven square miles and is considered to be one of the largest planned community developments in the country. Amidst lush, mature landscaping, McCormick Ranch offers golf course villas, townhomes and condos, as well as luxury estates on huge lots, single family homes and waterfront properties snuggled around seven man-made lakes. Amenities include two golf courses, bike paths, fishing and sailing. McCormick Ranch is home to approximately 27,000 people throughout its 67 unique subdivisions. Residents of McCormick Ranch come from all walks of life. Both young families and more seasoned retirees love the abundance of outdoor activities and residential amenities that the community has to offer. I feature a video of a home in each area every week so that you can get a feel for the homes that are currently on the market. If you find a home that you're interested in or want me to make a video walkthrough, please feel free to call me or send a text to 602-515-1161. Also, don't forget to download our buyer relocation guide in the description that will help you with your relocation to the Valley of the Sun.